In the 1980s and 90s, a widespread moral panic, often called the Satanic Panic, overtook America. With serial killer cases such as Richard Ramirez and Son of Sam, often the killers would leave behind pentagrams and other symbols the public believed to belong to Satan worshippers. This carried on well into the 90s, especially when the Columbine Massacre took place. The media scrutinized artists such as Marilyn Manson and Rob Zombie as being Satanist and causing the youth of the time to be violent. The roadside murders case was looked at as a satanic ritual because the six teenagers who did this claimed to be occultists. We have now come to realize that music, movies, and video games do not cause a person to be evil or violent. It's often a combination of severe mental illness, sexual, alcohol, and or drug abuse that exacerbates the demented and dark thoughts that certain individuals may have and that causes them to commit certain crimes. I mean, when was the last time you saw a serial killer that looked like me? It doesn't happen. So before we jump into our case, I just have one question to ask you. Wouldn't thou like to live deliciously? And if you would, please don't forget to hit that subscription button down below and you will be alerted every single time I upload a new true crime case. Vidar Lilliad was born and raised in Bergen, Norway. He moved to the U.S. in 1985 and in 1989 he married Delphina Zelaya. The two met through their faith in the Jehovah's Witness religion and the couple lived in Miami. After the couple conceived their daughter Tabitha, they moved to Knoxville, Tennessee for a better life for their children. Vidar worked as a bellman at a hotel and they soon had another child named Peter in 1995. The family took a small trip to a Jehovah's Witness assembly at the Freedom Hall in Johnson City, Tennessee on April 6, 1997. Another couple invited the Lilliads to dinner, but the couple was running low on money, so they turned down the dinner and started to make their way home. The Lilliads just moved into their home that needed several repairs and were planning a trip to Norway to visit Vidar's family within the next few months but they always saved up enough money to attend any local assemblies held by the Jehovah's Witness group they belonged to, because their faith was so important to them. If Vidar and Delfina knew what this road trip held for them, I'm quite sure that they would have stayed home. The couple were driving on Interstate 81 and took a break at a rest stop outside of Baileyton. Vidar was carrying Peter and approached a group of teenagers with a pamphlet and asked them if they believed in God. The teens, or the six as they are often referred to as, Vidar approached were Natasha Cornett and Karen Howell. Natasha was 18 and from Betsy Lane, Kentucky. She had a terrible relationship with her mother and even pulled a knife on her at one point. Natasha also dropped out of school before completing the ninth grade and abused drugs and alcohol. Natasha was a child of an affair that her mother had and grew up in poverty. She also suffered from mental illness and claimed she spoke to angels and demons. Karen, who was 17, was originally from Ohio and her family moved to Kentucky when she was a toddler. She grew up in a broken home and her parents would have severely violent fights up until they divorced when she was nine years old. Karen struggled with a learning disability and she claimed to have been sexually abused by her uncle and cousin. Karen often struggled to have a positive relationship with her family and started self-mutilation at 13. She also practiced dark witchcraft and drug use. Karen claimed that she possessed automatic writing, or what is sometimes called spirit writing, in which a person is not consciously writing, but is able to produce words on paper through spirit. Her mother attempted to have a local pastor cast the demons out of Karen, and she would also later tell the courts that she heard voices. Vidar's conversation with Natasha and Karen was interrupted by Joseph Risner and Jason Bryant. Joseph was 20 and the oldest of the group. He was a good kid until his mother and stepfather separated and him and his mother moved to Kentucky. Joseph started abusing drugs and performed poorly in school. He also claimed to be sexually abused by two different babysitters when he was 12 years old. Joseph at one point was romantically involved with Natasha but was now dating Karen. Jason was the youngest of the group at only 14, and he also struggled with a learning disability and was a legal minor at the time. He met Natasha only about a month before these events, and when she picked him up after he ran away from home, the two drank and kissed that night. 
Joseph pulled a gun on Vidar and said, quote, I'm sorry about this. Everybody just be quiet and nothing's going to happen to you. All we need is the van, end quote. He then led the Lilliads to their van and Vidar offered his keys and wallet to let him and his family stay behind at the rest stop, but Joseph refused and forced Vidar to drive the van while he sat in the passenger seat pointing the gun at him. Following the six and the Lilliads were Crystal Sturgill and Dean Mullins, who was driving Joseph's car. Crystal was 18 and from Harold, Kentucky. She was a good student and even had a job working with children at a daycare and a college application she was waiting to hear back from. Crystal had no history of violence or a criminal record, but had been suspended from school several times. She had a great amount of emotional neglect at home, and in December of 1996, she accused her stepfather of sexual abuse, and she was kicked out of her home. She lived with her aunt for a short while, but between January and April, she lived in 13 different places, the last being Natasha's home. Dean, who was 19 and also from Kentucky, dropped out of school his senior year and was working on his GED. He had no criminal record and held a job for one year in 1993. He was romantically involved with Natasha and his friends and family stated his behavior changed when he was with her. The idea for this road trip started about two days before the murders on April 4th. The six rented out a room at the Kali Hotel where they drank each other's blood, burned candles into the carpet, and used an Ouija board. It has also been claimed by several sources that the teens burned the numbers 666 into the carpet, but that has not been fully proven or disproven. It is believed by prosecutors that Natasha created the plan to commit the murders and then flee to Mexico, although the six claimed that they wanted to go to New Orleans. After the six trashed and checked out of the hotel room, they went back to Natasha's mother, Madonna's trailer, and were zombie-like as they came to pick up a few things. Karen told Madonna, quote, the end time is coming, end quote, and the six started traveling towards Tennessee and eventually ended up at the rest stop. Joseph's car did not run well and was rather small. They were traveling with two stolen guns, a 9mm and a 25 caliber, and some stolen cash as well. Joseph received a speeding ticket about an hour before they stopped, and they were attempting to find a car to hotwire, but the rest stop was too busy. Fast forward to where we left off, and the six and the Iliads were traveling down the highway while Vidar was driving. Delfina started singing to her children because she knew that they were scared and she wanted to help calm them down, and Jason shouted at her to stop and Tabitha wanted to befriend the teenagers because she was scared and she really didn't know what to do. So Tabitha offered Natasha a couple Hershey's kisses and Natasha turned them down. Joseph ordered Vidar to get off on a nearby exit and turn down Payne Hollow Lane. And after a few hundred yards, Joseph instructed the family to get out of the van. Joseph and Jason talked about what to do away from everyone else and Natasha made Jason promise to not hurt Tabitha or Peter. Natasha then approached Delfina and said, quote, I can't stop this. Just give me the children so they won't get hurt, end quote. Vidar and Delfina made one last attempt to save their family by offering his wallet and van. Delfina told them she would not remember what they look like anyway because all teenagers dress alike nowadays. The following events are still up for discussion by investigators to this day. In later interviews, Karen, Natasha, Crystal, Dean, and Joseph claim that Jason took control of the situation once the van stopped on the side of the road. All five of their stories have very small discrepancies, but many are still skeptical that the others wanted to blame it on the youngest and newcomer of the group. Joseph gave his gun to Natasha and then put the gun on the floor. Joseph said he did not want to continue with this plan. Jason then ordered the Iliads to stand on the side of the ditch and pointed the 25 caliber at Vidar. The Iliads begged him not to hurt them and they said they would not call the authorities. Karen and Natasha also pleaded with him to let the family go. A local contractor named Mark Gabby was near the scene mapping out a plot of land he was going to build a water tank when he heard a gunshot. He first assumed it was a hunter nearby. He then heard what he described as, quote, like children on a playground, end quote. This testimony by Mark has been under scrutiny by investigators for almost 24 years now. 
Was this the sound of Tabitha and Peter in shock watching their father get shot in the head? Or was it the sounds of the six laughing and joking in enjoyment about killing the Iliads? After Jason shot the family, the others claimed that he went back to the van to get the other gun and said, quote, they're still fucking alive, end quote, and went back to the Iliads and shot them again several times with a 9mm. Joseph claimed that after Jason shot the family, he went back to the van and started to cry. Jason then got into the van and told Joseph that he needed to hear some Marilyn Manson, but the stereo didn't work. Jason, of course, had a completely different story. He claimed that Joseph and Dean killed the Iliads and that he sat in the van and covered his eyes because he didn't want to watch the family be murdered. There were two 911 calls made in regards to gunshots heard on Payne Hollow Lane and Deputy Jeff Morgan arrived at the scene around 9 p.m. He saw the headlights shining from the Chevrolet Citation the six had been previously driving. The deputy checked the car, which was empty, and the license plate was gone. He then found four bodies laying in the ditch nearby, Vidar and Delfina with Tabitha and Peter laying on top of them. In the trials, it was claimed by prosecutors that the family was laid out in the shape of an upside-down cross, but the deputy said that he did not notice when he was searching for a sign of life. Tabitha moved slightly when she was laying on top of Vidar and was rushed to the hospital but was unfortunately pronounced dead the following morning. She had been shot once. Peter was shot twice, both times from a 25 caliber and was the only member of the family to survive. Vidar was the first to have been shot. That first bullet would have knocked him out immediately. He was shot at least four more times, but three shots from a 9mm pistol formed a perfect triangle on his upper right chest. Prosecutors believe that this pattern was intentional. Delfina was first shot in the arm and then her leg. She was shot six more times and had a similar triangle pattern from the same 9mm pistol. Delfina lived long enough to see her husband and children shot and long enough to be run over by the van as the six pulled off. The police were able to link the car by the VIN number to Joseph's mother, Mary Castle. She told police she hadn't seen Joseph in two days, but she knew who he was with. The six arrived at Douglas, Arizona, U.S.-Mexico border in the Iliad's 1987 Dodge van. They did not have proper identification and claimed to be lost. The officers at the border ran the license plate number and ordered everyone out of the van. When officers searched the van, they found the children's toys, a car seat, and the Iliad's family's photos. Natasha had a wallet that was searched, and it contained a piece of Vidar's belt and a photo of Tabitha that said, Summer 1995 and My Favorite Girl. Karen had a Hello Kitty diary lock that belonged to Tabitha, and Crystal had the keys to the Iliad home. When Natasha was arrested, she was asked by the booking officer what her religious preference was, and she simply said, quote, Satan, end quote. The news exploded after the arrests were made. They told a story of six kids who were disturbed and obsessed with devil worship. Natasha's lawyer, Eric Kahn, played up the image of a disturbed teenager who was mentally ill with nowhere to turn but devil worship in an attempt to get Natasha an insanity plea. The lawyers who defended the six all wanted separate trials, but Judge Eddie Beckner denied the request and ordered the six to be tried all together on March 6, 1998. The trial came much sooner than expected, and on February 20th, 1998, all six raised their right hands and admitted to the charges of murder and attempted murder. While the Bradley County jury selection process was going on, the six were offered a plea deal for life in prison without the possibility of parole, and they all accepted the offer. Joseph allegedly admitted the murders to a jail prison guard while he was on suicide watch, but because the guard had a previous arrest record, the prosecutors believed that his witness testimony wouldn't hold up in the court. The six had a week-long sentencing hearing. Joseph, Jason, Natasha, and Karen took the stand to testify. They were all fairly consistent besides Jason, who of course claimed that Joseph and Dean committed the murders. Dean and Crystal maintained their innocence to this day. They both claimed that neither one of them ever got out of the car, let alone pulled the trigger. 
they claim that they felt pressure to take the plea bargain and so they don't feel that it's fair that they received life in prison. Tennessee no longer allows inmates to have on-site interviews, but Crystal wrote back to a news outlet saying, quote, My inability to act altered more lives than I can imagine. I cannot change history, only use the life I have been granted to try to make a positive impact in the world I now know. I would give anything to be able to change what happened. Natasha has earned a GED and a cosmetology license in prison, but in August of 2001, it is believed she attacked fellow inmate Patricia Jones with fellow inmate Krista Pike, who was in prison waiting on death row for torturing and murdering a classmate from her high school. Natasha was not found guilty of this murder, but it's believed that she was involved in some way. And I couldn't find much information on the others and how they are serving their time in prison. Peter Iliad is now about 26 years old and he lives in Sweden. There was a custody battle after the murders between Delfina's mother, Lydia, and Vidar's sister, Randy, who pledged to raise Peter in the faith the way his parents would have wanted. Peter left the U.S. with a prosthetic eye and has trouble walking. But from what I read online, it appears that he finished an IT program in 2017 and was looking for work at the time. So what do you all think about this case? I find it so like incredibly sad and really frightening that they were just traveling home from an event and this happened. And it wasn't really even that far when I Google mapped it. It looked like it was only about an hour and a half, like two hours away from their home. And that's just really scary to think that something so local to you can happen and something so horrific and scary. And so I just feel really bad for them. And I feel bad for Peter because he grew up, you know, never really knowing his mom, his father or sister. And that's just really sad. I just find that really quite sad for him. But, you know, I hope he's doing well and, you know, living a good life despite that. And I kind of want to know what you guys think about whether you think that Jason was the main perpetrator or do you think it was all of them or do you think it's what Jason claimed that it was mostly Joseph and Dean? I really truly feel in my heart and in my spirit that all of them took part in some way. It may have been, you know, maybe somebody was kind of like forcing them to do something and forced them to get out of the car or whatever it was, but I truly feel like they all did have a part in it. And I really do feel like they all deserve, you know, the punishment they got. Uh, maybe even the death penalty. I know some people, um, you know, don't like the death penalty or don't agree with it, but I do feel like that they took that plea bargain so they wouldn't get that because it was kind of hard to prove who exactly did what because the five mostly claimed that it was Jason and then Jason claimed that it wasn't really him. So I know that the death penalty probably would not have been on the table, but it's, you know, I do feel like they at least deserve life in prison, especially Christina, because apparently, you know, she tried to kill another prisoner. So that's really scary. And, you know, I don't really know what's going on with the others, but they all seem like they are just unwell. And unfortunately, um, you know, it goes to show that it's not the content we consume that makes us evil or do bad things. It's severe, like, mental illness and then doing drugs on top of it. You know, it's, you know, they all, a lot of them said they were, like, hearing voices. And so it's so important, you know, if you're having any issues, it's so important to get help if you can. Um, you know, again, I try to leave links down below about any type of help if you guys need it or know someone who needs it. Um, because, you know, we wouldn't want something like this to happen again because it's so unfortunate that it happened. But otherwise, I hope you guys found this video helpful or informative. If you did, please let me know in the comments and let me know any other cases you would like me to cover. I'm always interested in a lot of different cases and you guys have left me some really good ones down below. So, um, yeah, let me know down below what you want me to uh, cover. And otherwise, I hope you guys have a great day. We are off to spooky season now, so I have some really cool videos, some true crime and non-true crime related, some more like cryptid stories, um, maybe some spooky things, so other things besides just true crime. So let me know what you guys want me to make for you this month. So otherwise, I hope you guys have a great day and stay safe. Bye-bye.